beloved church? You know, this morning there's much to be said, there's much to be felt, there's much to hear, but there's also a posture that I want to be true of Cross Point, not just you, but even Cross Point downtown and Cross Point as a whole, a posture that's so necessary. And, and here's what I'm going to ask of you to do with me, is that you would join me if you are able to go down on your knees because we are absolutely dependent upon God this morning. And so I want to lead us in a prayer. God, we are, we are at your mercy, Lord. We've seen you do marvelous things again and again and again. And we want to see those marvelous things be done again and again and again. And Father, many of us come into the room and we're licking our wounds and we feel hurt. We feel broken. God, we feel the mess that is the church. The mess that has always been the church, Lord. A mess that you stepped in and so beautifully brought reconciliation to. God, a mess that you through the blood in your veins was spilt, God. So that Jesus Christ would forever be lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come. That the fresh wind of his power would move God in my words, Lord. That the fire of his all-consuming power would quench any work of Satan, would cease it, God. And we come and we ask that you would bring a supernatural unity that will not exist without your movement right now. We ask it, God. Only you can do it. Only you can do it, Lord. We're trusting that this time would not be in vain, and Lord, we lift up Pastor Chan and Stacy and Abby and Aubrey and Amber. Our love and affection goes to them, Lord. We know, we know, God, you're caring for them. And God, I thank you for them so personally. But Lord, may today be about what you desire to do as Jesus is exalted. In your name, church says, amen. at that. I already got everybody working hard this morning. <laughs> this whole idea of church is a supernatural thing. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't Chan's idea. It wasn't the disciples' idea. It was God's idea. It's God's idea. The whole purpose of the church is to be a refuge in a lost and broken world. And I heard one man say that the church is like the ark. You ever thought about Noah and his family in that ark and how bad it must have smelled? <laughs> he said, they probably wanted to jump out, but if they did, they would have died. And that's the refuge that God has for us as the church. There's a storm, and Jesus is in the middle of the storm, and he's in the boat sleeping. And Jesus shows the disciples that he, while in the middle of the storm, is both the storm and the refuge. This is the nature of God. Nothing catches him by surprise. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord whoever, or who should ever be his counselor? God's not sitting on somebody's easy chair saying, I don't know what to do about this. He's not. God is orchestrating all things in accordance with his glory. And listen to me, our good and the good of those whom we love and care for, I can look at you in the eye and say that with confidence because I've seen it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
And we come here by faith. By faith. Say that with me. By faith. By faith. You know that the word faith is mentioned 33 times in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 10 starts what is the most, what is the most frequent pro- progression, but chapter 11 takes, takes the cake 25 times in chapter 11. Before chapter 10, it's only mentioned three times. From chapter 10 onward, it's mentioned 30 times. I think the author, I think that God is trying to say something there. And the whole idea of the second half of the book of Hebrews that we're moving into now is endure. By faith, endure. The first part of the book of Hebrews pointed us to the supremacy of Jesus Christ in all things. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the old covenant. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Now, by faith, walk, believing that Jesus is greater. By faith, endure so that you are clinging fast to him here and now. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And that's the message that the author wants to drive home. And do you know why that is? Because there's only one thing that pleases God, only one thing. And that is, say it with me, faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith. Today is our by faith moment. Today is our by faith moment. God has always asked the church to be a people of faith. God has always asked his people to walk in faithfulness. He doesn't ask us to do anything. He just asks us to believe in him, to trust him, to walk in the way in which he calls. That's both a personal and a corporate call, by the way. It's for your life and it's for your church. It's for us as the people of God by faith. And there's these living illustrations that we have before us. He takes the whole Old Testament text and he dissects every single individual there. I mean, you could imagine the kids of Israel were growing up with an Abraham action figure and a Moses action figure. And they were fighting the Philistines and the, the, and the evil empires of their times. And, and the kids were, were, were being taught the stories of the faith and, and how God would continually rescue them over and over and over again. And these heroes of the faith were so profound and so powerful. And the author of Hebrews just drops the mic on them when he says the name Jesus. Because all of those guys just point to somebody greater. All of those guys just point to somebody more significant, more powerful. And and you know what's really weird about it? You don't really want a Jesus on the cross action figure, do you? No. No, but that's what we got. And that's what we needed God didn't give us what we want. He gave us what we needed. Right here, we're walking through some difficult times. And I can honestly say nobody wanted it. But I can honestly say that God only moves us in the way that he needs us to go. Author Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. He says, God does not give us everything we want. But he does fulfill his promises. Leading us along the best and straightest paths to himself. Sometimes I think I'm in control. And when I think I'm in control, 
and what I want doesn't happen, well, then I realize I'm not in control. <laughs> That's one of the great signs that says you're not in control is because you can't get everything that you want. You can't do everything that you want. But one of the best realizations for us is to understand that we're not in control and, and, and God loves us enough not to crush us with everything that we want because you know where it would take us? A U-turn away from him. God takes us the straightest path to himself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer died in a Nazi concentration camp. By faith, he died in a Nazi concentration camp. By faith, we all walk the path that God calls us, saying that I don't get to call the shots, but he does. I'm here because I didn't have a choice. Seriously. I knew I had to be here as soon as your elders called me. I knew this was where God wanted me to be today for this time and this space. Because God is the one who determines all things, both in the, in the past, for the present, and for the future. Faith is not simply something that, that we, religi we religiously hold on to. In fact, faith is something that everyone actually has. Whether you believe in God or not, you have faith. Because you have to put faith in something. Because everything in your life is banking on something. Whether that be a big bang or some kind of primordial mud that we're all made out of. You're putting faith in something. And what the Bible says is you're putting faith in the fact that God exists. And he made everything that we see out of things that we can't see. He made something out of nothing. And God will make something out of nothing again and again and again and again and again as we walk by faith and we trust in him. You, you don't get to decide that. I'm, I'm just going to say that over and over and over again. You don't get to decide that. I don't get to decide that. But we get to walk in trusting him. God rewards those who seek him, church. I was so pleased to see 45 people praying back here this morning. I was so pleased that we could get on our knees and seek the Lord today. God is more pleased. His smile comes when we are looking towards Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And church, may our eyes be fixated just there. Listen, I can tell you with all confidence, that's what Chan would want right now. That's what he wants right now, that we would look to Jesus he preached it over and over and over again. And guess what? You've heard this before. The gospel is not just for eternal life, but it's for everyday life. And right now is when the rubber meets the road. And we've got our individual stuff. We've got our professional stuff. We've got all this kind of stuff. And right smack dab in the middle of it, God says that I am most important, so look to me. And that's what we're doing. By faith. By faith. You know, faith is, is where we trust like a child. Not everybody has children. You don't have to have children because all of us have been children, so we can understand this il illustration. We're at the mercies of our parents or our adopted parents or wherever God placed us. We're at the mercies of someone to care for us to allow for our lives to, to, to have significance. You know, we, we, we come into this world helpless. We come into this world not being able to do anything. And Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 18, 1 through 4, he says, at the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's most qualified to be your chief of staff, Jesus? Who's most qualified to be your secretary of defense? When you set up shop here, Jesus, and you rule the world, I want to be to your left and to your right. That's adulting back then. Jesus says, and calling him a child. Hey, hey listen, disciples. Listen, I'm going to bring up this little child. I'm going to show you this is the way you should be. Calling to him a child, he put him in his midst and he said, uh, midst of them, and he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom. Whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest 
in the kingdom of heaven. He looked at those disciples and he said that this child, this child, this humble child is most deserving of the highest place in the kingdom. That's countercultural. That child didn't earn it. That child didn't do anything to get it. Here they were. They've been by him, by his side all that time. And he says to them, no, 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 no. I would rather have this child sit at those places because the child exhibits faith. We need to become kids again. I'm all for that. I got kids and I spoil those kids to the hilt and they kind of know it. They really know it. There's a lot of other people that spoil them too. But you know, those, the, the kids, my children, the children that are over there right now, and what a blessing that they have to be parented in such a way that they grow up in the admonition of the Lord, in the fear and the knowledge of him. May they never grow out of that. One of the challenges that we have with parenting our children by faith is that we have to simultaneously parent them out of dependence on us and into dependence on God. That's hard. That's really hard, especially when I struggle with the dependence upon God part. But listen, that's where we're at. That's where we're at in this life. We're all dependent upon him. You don't know when the tests are going to come back and the tumor's malignant or benign. You don't know when these things, you don't know when all hell is going to break loose, but you do know that God's in the middle of the mess. And God speaks, and it's by faith that we seek him. He gives us two examples. This is striking, by the way, the way the author of Hebrews opens with these two examples. Two examples of the faithful. Who are the faithful? He gives two examples. Actually, he gives a whole laundry list of examples. I'm going to point us to two in our time together. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. If you know the story, Cain and Abel were the first, the first born, like literally born, from Eve. There was the mess that happened in the garden. There was the curse that God placed upon Adam and Eve, and as such, all humanity, born into sin. And there is renewal that God also promised with the, with the sacrifice, with the promise of the son who would to come, who would come. Remember, they put on fig leaves? And in order for God to clothe their nakedness, there had to be an animal that was killed that would clothe them. I got to think that Adam and Eve took that to heart and taught something to their children. I got to also think that Abel was the only one who learned something there. Is that if you're going to stand before a holy God, you can't come with your own efforts. You know, Cain would toil and labor for that fruit. He worked hard. He woke up early. That fruit grew in accordance to what he wanted to it to grow. And it was his prized work, his prized possession. He went to bed late, exhausted. He came to God and he said, God, here's my best offering. Before your holiness, here's my best works. Here's what I have to give you. And Abel stood on the blood of of a lamb, because Abel knew that if he were going to stand before the presence of God, he couldn't do it with mere fig leaves. He couldn't do it with his own efforts. He couldn't hide his nakedness and shame. He had to rely on the sacrifice of a lamb, one who was to come. So that's why the author of Hebrews says, by faith, Abel was looking ahead, and he needed something greater. And so he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. And you know what happened to Abel as a result? The envy and jealousy and anger of Cain burned against his brother and his faith got him murdered. <laughs> Whew, I don't want that. And then you have Enoch. 
Enoch's an interesting character, lived 365 years. You think that's a long time? Well, his son lived like 965 years, so he was pretty much down there as far as his age, and God took him. So, on one hand, you have the faith of Abel, who was slaughtered, and then you have the faith of Enoch, who was spared death. Have you ever gone through this kind of faith covetousness before, where you see the faith of another and the rewards that seem to be given to them because of their faith, and you say, my faith should be producing that? No, 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 no. That's not faith. No, faith is not on the rewards that come. It's on the reward, the rock-solid object of faith is Jesus. Faith is not about what God gives. Faith is not about some pie in the sky. Faith is not about what, what, what we want. Faith is about what God has defined it, and God has defined it as Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And so by faith, we look to Christ, and we walk in obedience to whatever that path may take us. And I'm telling you right now, the path looks rocky, and it's difficult, and there are some hard things ahead, but our God is a God of the impossible. He is. One of the things that I've learned so powerfully from Chan is that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the senior pastor of the church. He plants it, he makes it grow, and he shuts it down. That's up to Jesus, not up to me. I'm going to follow him in the midst of it. And that's by faith. By faith. I've had the privilege of reading, leading Cross Point downtown for the last two years. And we've walked through some difficulties ourselves. When I got there, the lead pastor had, uh, in, had resigned due to a moral failure, dealing with, with taking ex- money and also not being faithful to his wife. Those two things hit. You got a congregation of about 70 people, and some real difficulties emerge there. And then you got me who thinks I can, I can do it all, man. I'm going to go in, and I'm just going to clean this thing up, and we're going to be rocking and rolling. No way. I got to deal with my own stuff. And I got it. And I've had it. And I didn't even realize it, but man, God just, just so graciously and lovingly exposes that to me as he calls the church to be in life with me. And they get to see it. And we're all walking in that together, and it's, this, it's, it's a mess, but it's a mess that God is working so powerfully in it. We are God's beautiful mess. So are you. You are God's beautiful mess that God is bringing redemption to right now. I, I have to believe that as the word's spoken, and as the Bible's open, and as the hearts are turned towards him, people will come to know Jesus today for the first time. I have to believe that as I come up here and preach the word of God, that there's this sanctifying power that the Holy Spirit is producing to where not that we're going to go home and change, you're changing right now. It's happening right now. And not only you, but all of us. The church is changing. Things are happening. He's moving in these mysterious ways. He's bringing to bear reality upon us and and, 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 and now our hearts are all looking towards him. Our eyes are all focused on him. And, and, and God is doing what none of us could have ever dreamed in order to see Orlando transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God. Right smack dab in the middle of the mess. How many of you have come to God most powerfully in the most darkest times of your life? Let, let me see uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe the same is true of all of us here today. His light pierces through the darkness, and the darkness cannot hide from him. That's why Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But Cain and Abel, they point to a better sacrifice. Cain and Abel didn't point, to, uh, point us to the law in order to follow it completely because we couldn't. In fact, only the law shows us that we're absolutely unable to follow it completely and perfectly. And if we can't keep one part of it, we can't keep all of it, so we're guilty because of it. 
And so even the law shows us that we need something greater than the law in order to find holiness and righteousness with God. And so like Isaiah, when he sees God before the throne, when he sees the seraphim encircling the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He takes a proper posture and he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. He has something that I don't. He has something that I need. So I'm going to ask him for it. And then he lives his life for the glory of God to a people who don't want to hear what he has to say. Don't want to do what he tells them to do. But yet at the same time, from his powerful prophecies came the the majesty and mystery of the gospel in Jesus Christ. The lamb who was slain. The mangled, disfigured person on the tree. Cursed is every man who dies on the tree. But Jesus takes the curse and what does he do? He redeems the curse And he takes the brokenness and he gives us the promise. And he says that what Christ has done is paid your penalty in in full before the holiness of God. So that what you have to stand on today is not the messiness that we're in, but it's the complete and perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then from that, he tells us to look forward for the promise of what's ahead. Well, there's some good promises ahead. He's going to come back, and he's, there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a reckoning. Those who trust in Jesus as their forgiver, leader, and Lord, they will ride on the wings of eagles straight to heaven because of the work of Jesus Christ, because his righteousness is the only thing acceptable before a holy God. And those who don't trust in his righteousness, no matter how good their works have been, no matter how the fruit of their labors might seem appealing to God, God calls it filthiness. Because at that day of reckoning, Jesus wants those who trust him like a child. And those who trust him as his children are those whom he brings into his family, forever protecting them. That's the church. The story of Abraham is not a perfect story. If you've been reading your Bible through the year, it's like a bad reality show. Noah, Abraham, Moses. Yeah, there are some good things that happened to it, but Moses was a murderer. David, David was the greatest king this world may have ever seen. And he killed Goliath with a stone. He was the champion of the Israelites. He also slept with, an, his, with one of his best friend's wife who was out in the battle. He was a murderer. Rahab, she was the Jericho harlot. She's in the hall of faith right here. Thank God for Rahab. Thank God for Sarah. Thank God for Abraham. Thank God for David. Thank God for Moses. Thank God for these men and women who God used so powerfully. They were champions. We watched the Super Bowl last week, didn't we? And it was a pretty good game. Really good game. One of the best Super Bowl games I've ever seen. That's a powerful storyline. Backup quarterback. He He was a wonderer for quite some time. Started out at the Eagles. Couldn't find a landing place. Brought him back as the backup. Carson Wentz, great quarterback. Went down. My brother-in-law is a big Eagles fan. He thought the season was over. So did everybody else. (laughs) Not Nick Foles. Nick Foles just stepped in and he did what he did. And he did it again and he did it again. And whether we win or lose, I'm going to do it again. And he he just did his job. And he's the Super Bowl MVP. Turned out to be the champion. Wow. That's a story, isn't it? We have this, this innate desire to, to find a champion in our culture. We want to be the champion, 
or we want to make somebody else the champion. And here's what the book of Hebrews actually tells us about the champion. If you got your Bible open, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. There's your champion on the cross, seated now at the right hand of the throne of God. We come on Sunday morning here today to say death is not the end, but new life springs up because Christ's work continues to this day, right now. By the power of his Holy Spirit, he's doing it. So I want to give you this application. Faith seeks, number one, faith seeks. Look to God. Friends, we need people in our church right now that are taking their cues from God, they're reading their Bible, they're praying, we are on our knees, we're, we're just thirsty for him to work. Seek after God with all your heart. Are you seeking after him? Second point, faith trusts. Faith trusts like a child. We know that God is our father and he's orchestrating all things towards his good end and purposes. We have to trust him. We have to trust the ways that God leads through this church and the elders and leaders here. And I know things might be difficult, but the word remains true. And God will do some powerful things in the midst of the mess. And our call is to trust him. Faith trusts. And finally, faith obeys. Faith without obedience isn't faith, says James. Faith obeys. Faith follows after God. Faith is the thing that causes us to do what God has called us to do. All of the men and women in the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11, their faith was not just something they said. We're reading about them because their faith was something they did. And we will as well. And as we so powerfully watch, we see that Jesus is really our champion. God has someone to take this church in the, in the way that he's called her to go. But at the end of the day, whoever that person is, they're just going to be pointing to Christ. Because he's the one that's the author and perfecter of our faith. Carrie Underwood wrote this song earlier this year. It was in the Super Bowl, sold 16,000 copies, digital copies, the night of the Super Bowl Sunday. She wrote this. In, in writing it, she says, I'm invincible, unbreakable, unstoppable, unshakable. Things knock me down, get up again. <laughs> you, you know, it, it just goes to show you, we, we all want this to be true of ourselves. But listen, we're all in this mangled, broken mess. And what does God point us to to show us our champion? This mangled, broken mess. That he has perfectly used his perfect obedience on our behalf to make perfect all as it should be. Sally Lloyd-Jones says it in the Jesus Storybook Bibles. And all the sad things come untrue through his work, our champion. There's blood that runs through that victor's veins that we can claim victory right now. God knows the end of the story. We don't get to write it. He's writing it but he's invited us to be a part of the story. And I'm going to be a part of the story by seeking God, by trusting God, and by walking in obedience to him. And I ask, church, I ask, I plead with you. I plead with you, would you do the same? Would you do the same? Let's go to the, word, the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we look to you right now. 
God, so much of me can struggle in all of my own life because, God, things are thrown at me. I don't know how to deal with them. I don't know what to do with them. God, I just confess, Carrie and I have cried a whole lot this week and last week. God, it leaves us kind of wondering what's next. Wondering how you're going to move, God. But God, right now, I just believe you're, you're telling us that we don't have to wonder. We don't have to we don't have to be the ones that determine the destiny of this, God. We just have to follow after you. So, Holy Spirit, would you give us the confidence that causes us to follow? God, would you give us the gift of faith? If someone here struggles with faith, God, would they go to the elders today and ask for prayer?